All right, as our children head off to Children's Church, I invite you to turn your Bibles. To Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. That's on page 1039 in uh, the Pew Bible, if you need to... to, to take advantage of that, reading from the same version. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 10. Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Let's read. After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all, his, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. May God bless the ring of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Revelation and your purposes in giving it to your church. And so use use it now, Father, in the lives of this church, your church, your local church. Bless us, Father. Give us grace to receive your word, to believe it, and to live it. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The word hallelujah means praise the Lord. It comes from the Hebrew language. Hallel, the first part, means praise. And Jah or Yah, as we pronounce it at the end, is is short for Yahweh, which, of course, is translated Lord. And we find this word in only two books in the entire Bible. One of them you would expect, the Psalms. It's particularly seen a number of times in Psalms 113 through 118, which are referred to as the Hallel Psalms. And they were particularly sung during the time of the Passover, the festival where the Jews celebrated their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. In fact, the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, refer to Jesus and his disciples singing a hymn after their observance of the Passover, which, of course, became the Lord's Supper. Jesus and his disciples most likely sang a Hallel hymn, a Hallel psalm, singing Hallelujah that night. And the only other book 
Actually, the only other passage in Scripture that contains the word hallelujah is right here in Revelation 19. And just like in English here, the word has been transliterated into the original Greek language of the New Testament. Four times here in chapter 19, a a great multitude sings hallelujah. And the four times uh, is probably not by accident as numbers are always significant in the book of Revelation. Four symbolizes something worldwide or universal. And so it would appear here that it symbolizes all of God's people, all of God's people singing hallelujah. And this is the last song as well recorded in the whole Bible. And it's depicting the end of history. And so, can you imagine this? Can you imagine this day coming? Just like the hallelujah chorus being sung at the end of a Christmas program where we all get goosebumps hearing it. This time, it's sung not by just one choir in one church but the full number of saints throughout all time singing hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And why are they praising the Lord here? Well, as we saw last week, Babylon, the symbolic name for the world in rebellion against God and persecuting his people, it has now been defeated. In contrast, the world now is singing, woe, woe, woe. We see, we see, see this three times in the previous chapter. Chapter 18, verses 10, 16, and 19, the world cries, woe. The ESV, unfortunately, translates it, alas, Uh, But it's the exact same Greek word that we see and translated in other parts of Revelation as woe. So their pleasure, the world's pleasure in sin and idolatry has turned to mourning. God's judgment has come. And with that, the mourning of God's people has turned to joy. Now is the time of the fulfillment of all of God's promises to his people. Their enemies are defeated, and we now have the marriage supper of the Lamb when Jesus comes to dwell with his people forever. So that is why they are praising his name, singing hallelujah. And so in particular, I want to show, point out five reasons Five particular praises that the people are giving here in this scene because of the fulfillment of God's promises to them here. And so the first one is, our God is great. Our God is great. A great multitude in heaven were crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has, av- and, and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And so I want us to zero in there on that first phrase, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. The multitude singing understand Who brought them their victory over their enemies? And with that, their salvation. God did it. That's why it says salvation belongs to God. We can take no credit for it, in other other words. It's, It's just like how the rights of a song belongs to the one who wrote it. God is the author of our faith, the author of our salvation. And he could do so because all power belongs to him as well. That means that there is nothing in all creation that can hinder or resist him in any way. What he wills, he always accomplishes. And it is in light of that 
that then glory belongs to him as well. He, folks, is in a league of his own. Because of who he is, what he can do, he is in a league of, of his own. But, more specifically to our text here, is that we might be tempted to keep some glory for ourselves if we thought we had helped in our salvation. But Scripture teaches us, like in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that it is a gift so that no one can boast. Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Every part of our salvation was accomplished by God. We were predestined before the foundation of the world, he chose to pour out grace on us to, to save us. Then he sent his son into the world who, while we were in rebellion against God, died on the cross to pay for our sins, rose on the third day, proving he had accomplished it. And then uh, us still in our, our rebellion, uh, our hard hearts, he sent the Holy Spirit to us to change our hearts, to transform us so that we can believe in him and be saved. Every aspect of our salvation is a total work of God. The glory belongs to him alone. And folks, there is such a freedom when we can see that salvation and glory and power belong only to God. If we think that our salvation or the defeat of, of the enemies of God or the preservation of the good in this world is up to us, then we will live a sad and frustrated life. Sure, God uses us. We participate in his purposes. But God is the one underneath everything, behind the scenes, accomplishing it all. That, that, that's part of what, of, of what the book of Revelation has been about. Peeling back the curtain. And allowing John to show us what's going on in the throne room of God. And how he has his angels actively working as well. Even every church has an angel, according to chapters 2 and 3, working behind the scenes. Obviously under the lordship of, of Christ. And, 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 for the people, and for the people of God, that reality takes the weight off of us and puts it where it is supposed to be on God. So often we carry a weight we were never meant to carry. We are to live by faith in God. His so he is sovereign over all. He is all-powerful. And in trusting Him with everything, He gets all. That's the first reason they praise him. That brings us to our second point. All our enemies will be gone. All of our enemies will be gone. God is being praised for the salvation he has given us from our enemies. God has judged the great prostitute and removed her. The great prostitute refers to really everything about our society that seeks to lead people away from God. It involves everything from economic institutions like businesses and corporations to political institutions like political parties or, or labor unions to cultural institutions like the media and entertainment. And none of these things are bad in and of themselves. Business and commerce and the media can do good things. Yet, they can also lead people away from God and oppress God's people. And that is what happens every day all over the world. Satan uses them for his purposes. The, uh, the, the world is made up of sinful people who are easily manipulated by, God, by Satan for his purposes. He uses, he uses the world to exalt other things uh, above God or that go contrary to God's will or to promote a, a life without God. 
which then makes it evil, evil purposes. And so the people of God, the saints, are praising God for his judgment because, as we see, there is no salvation without it. When, we, when you look at the Old Testament, salvation always involved the removal and defeat of the enemy. God didn't just free Israel from slavery. He also defeated Pharaoh and Egypt. The nation was decimated, and the army drowned in the sea. There could be no new heaven and new earth if those in sin remained. And so in verse 3, the great multitude of believers cried out again, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And let me add, it's not just this sinful world that we will be praising God for, for removing. It will also include the removal and judgment of Satan that we'll read more about in chapter 20. And we will also be praising the Lord for something else that surprisingly, uh, John doesn't talk more about in Revelation as I would have thought he would as compared to perhaps the Apostle Paul. And that is this hidden evils of our hearts. That too will be removed. The Lord is going to remove all of our enemies. And the greatest can often be our own hearts. You see, if it wasn't for the sin that still exists in us, even as Christians, the sin of this world would not be as threatening Jesus was born into the world without sin and perfectly resisted it. But we, folks, were born in sin, which gives us natural desires towards sin. That is why temptation is so effective against us. Now, we know that through Christ's saving work, we have been given the Holy Spirit. Every Christian possesses the Holy Spirit. Don't let anyone tell you differently. Okay, we have been baptized into the Holy Spirit, all right? Don't let a charismatic tell you any different. You, you possess the Holy Spirit. You've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit changes our hearts and gives us faith in Jesus Christ and a will to fight against sin. Without the Spirit, we could do none of that. It is all a supernatural work of the Spirit. Yet, we won't be given perfect hearts like Jesus until this day described here in Revelation 19. Until then, we are to practice repentance daily. Repentance, uh, just for a review for you, involves seeing it, seeing our sin. It involves mourning over our sin. It involves confessing our sin. That's why we have our time of confession at each service, we're modeling for you something uh, you're, you're to do daily in your life, acknowledging your sin, confessing it. We are to be ashamed of our sin. We are to hate our sin. Do you hate your sin? Do you hate your sin? Does it grieve you? Finally, we are to turn from our sin. But according to this passage, one day we'll be singing hallelujah because our Lord will remove our sinful nature along with all of our other enemies forever. He's going to make it where we can't sin anymore. That's when it speaks of our glorification. That's what it's, it's talking about. A, a part of what it's talking about is that, is that we're gonna, we're, it's going to be removed forever. We're going to be transformed. And it's, it's, it's all part of his grace that he removes it forever. Folks, what a glorious thought. I hope that moves you to think that one day you will be freed from sin. As we sing, as we sing, save to sin no more. Let us long for that day. Because I think if we long for that day, 
It'll help us in our sanctification now, our repentance now, fighting against it. That brings us to our third reason to praise the Lord. Our work will be done. Our work will be done. In verse 4 it says, The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. The 24 elders, uh, we've, just, we talked about them back in uh, chapter 4, are symbolic they are symbolic for all of God's people. 12 plus 12 equals 24. 12 symbolizing the tribes of Israel. 12 symbolizing the 12 apostles of the church. Uh, together being 24. The four living creatures around the throne symbolizing all of creation and submission to God. As again, four symbolizes something worldwide. Like the four corners of the earth. When we, when we use that, that saying. So, so in other words, all of God's people and all of nature is worshiping the Lord here. And then a voice from the throne says, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. There are a couple things to point out here. First is that a believer in Jesus Christ is a servant of God. It means when God first redeems us, we become his servant. Now, we become some other things as well. We, we, we become some other glorious things. We become children of God. We are, we are adopted and called sons of God, and we have this wonderful privilege. We are co-heirs with Christ. We are all those things, but we are also servants. Paul describes himself as a servant of Christ on a number of occasions. And as verse 5 says, we come in all shapes and sizes, small and great, it says. Some become well-known for their faith their, their, than their works, yet most are never known outside those they immediately impacted. But Jesus knows. He knows, he knows us all. He sees. He sees when you're teaching those, those little ones upstairs. Praise God for, for Janessa and, and all of our teachers with the children. Praise God for all of you who, who, who work in children's church and are in our nursery. It may seem small, but it is not in God's eyes. He sees when we're sharing the gospel with a stranger. He sees us visiting the sick. He sees us taking care of our, our, our families, whether it's working long hours or our, our stay-at-home moms tirelessly trying to keep the house up and raise children and, and all these things to provide a godly place for their family. He sees, he sees spraying for weeds. <laughs> out here to keep the, keep the property look, looking, looking nice and being good stewards of what we have. He sees it all. He sees it all, everything done in his name. The other thing to mention is that being a servant of Christ isn't easy. As Paul refers to himself as a servant of Christ and defends his ministry against the, the false apostles in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says this, are they, meaning the false, uh, false apostles, are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers and danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night and hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from, all, from, apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. 
To sum up Paul's words, folks, being a servant of Christ is hard. It is really hard. But that's what we are and what we do if we belong to Christ. There is no option B. There is no, there's, there, there's no uh, alternative package deal that you can get that, that leaves out the servant part of our faith. We are saved by grace unto good works. And so another reason to praise our Lord as we look with great hope to this day is that the work will finally be done. It will be finished. The hard labors and difficult days will come to an end. And I know some of you could really use that right now. And so what Revelation 19 is telling you is that it's coming. It's coming. So find hope in that. May that encourage you to keep on serving until that day finally comes. Keep serving your family. Keep loving and caring for your church. Keep being that witness because one day the work will be finished. It will be done. And it will all be worth it. It will all be worth it. Then we come to verses 6 through 10. And the final hallelujah, perhaps the greatest hallelujah of all, at least it's the one with the most grand description. The voice of the multitude is like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder. And it's because it's the hallelujah for the great marriage supper of the Lamb. And with it, it is the fulfillment of our greatest hope of all to dwell with our Lord and Savior forever in the joy of His perfect peace. It says in verses 6 and 7, For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. But why is it that the institution of marriage and the Christian faith parallel each other so much in the scriptures as we see here well for one I think it is very much purposeful very much purposeful the biblical writers didn't think you know what I see some parallels between marriage and Christ in the church so therefore I'm going to write it in here and, and use that as an example no The way it's presented in Scripture is that that was on purpose when marriage was instituted instituted in Genesis 1 and 2. And so that's why there's no marriage between people in heaven, as Jesus tells us in the Gospels. Our marriage in this life is pointing to the greater marriage the church has to Christ in heaven. So that's one one reason. Then, of course, Paul shows us in Ephesians 5 the rest of it, particularly how marriage points to the gospel. He says, Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And we husbands regularly, regularly fail our wives in this. But in the greatest love story of all, Christ gave his life to ransom his bride. We had all despised the one we had been betrothed to, like the wife Gomer, which we read earlier, how she was unfaithful to the prophet Hosea, or how Israel was unfaithful to God. But Christ in his great love pursued his wife and died for her while we were still sinners in rebellion against him and removed all of our dirt and stains and restored us. Christ loved us as we would hope and imagine husbands should love their wives today. 
And Paul says again in Ephesians 5 that wives should submit to their own husbands as the church is to submit to Christ. This isn't for the purpose of promoting some kind of male dominance over women. This is, the, this is to point people to the glorious gospel. As Christ gave his life for his bride, the bride in return, in love, gives her life to her husband, trusting in his great love by following his leadership. And we see this in Revelation 19, 7 and 8. It says, For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So what distinguishes us as the true bride of Christ is that unlike the world, we submit and walk in obedience to Christ. And here we, we, we see that. Some see the bride's clothing as her justification, being made right with God and clothed in his righteousness. And certainly in other contexts, scripture, scriptural context, that is true. We've, we even sing about it today, the righteousness of Christ clothed in his righteousness. But I don't think that is, I don't think it's speaking of justification here because John spells it out very clearly. He says the clothing or fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, that, is, that doesn't mean we earn our marriage with Christ, for it also says there it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen or in righteous deeds. In other words, we are given grace by God when he saves us that then empowers us to do good works. It's really God's works being done through us by the grace he gives us. We serve him and, and, and do good works. So, a godly marriage points to the greater marriage. As a husband loves his wife and the wife submits to her husband, it points to the marriage of Christ and his church. And so the scene here is like a great wedding of ancient times. This is a marriage arranged like an, an ancient wedding would have been arranged, or even in some parts of the world still. It's not just where a man and a woman fall in love and decide to get married. No, it, instead it's, it's like the, the, the family of the, of the young man goes over to a family of a young woman and says, hey, would you like to work something out here? It's, it's an arranged marriage. Well, guess what, folks? The church has an arranged marriage with Christ, <laughs> chosen before the foundation of the world. And, and the bridegroom has paid the bride price, the dowry that they would have in ancient times, and he paid it with his own blood in his death. Yet the bridegroom didn't come immediately for his bride. She had to, to wait for a while. And during that time, she was mistreated by others. But now the bridegroom has finally come. And he has condemned and removed those who harmed his precious bride. And now he takes her to be with him to live happily ever after. And folks, I'm, I'm sorry if I didn't set it up well enough for you. But this is to be the wedding of all weddings. This is to be the happiest of all brides. This is the moment we have longed for. And so that is why we have this strange back and forth in verses 9 and 10. The angel says to John in verse 9 to write, to write down, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then verse 10, John fell down at his feet to worship the angel. And the angel stops him and tells him that he's, he's just a servant like him and he shouldn't be worshipped, that he should worship God. And so, I'm sure you're like me, you're, you read that and you're like, what? why is that in here? This glorious scene, why is, is that in here? Well, I think, 
I, be, I believe that, that this, is, this is because what we see in the Old Testament. And uh, if you remember in the Old Testament, we went back when we were in 2 Samuel, um, you remember that uh, David's son Absalom rebelled against him and got, uh, betrayed him, got his own army. There was a battle bet- between the two, and, uh, and so Absalom was killed in the battle. And Joab, the head of David's uh, army, uh, was going to send. Uh, he knew how David would would how he would receive this. It would it would, it would kill him, and uh, so he was going to send this foreigner, a slave, to go give the news to David. And uh, and so there's and so the idea is is you send someone that's not well liked anyway, someone to, to take bad news, and so but it's, but then there's this other guy named Ahimeaz who was a son of the priest and a messenger of David. And he was like, no, I want to go. I want to go tell David this news. And Ahimeaz, he's thinking all about the kingdom. He's thinking about the, 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 the glory of God and, and, all, and how this enemy, even though it was David's son, this enemy had, 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 been, had been removed. So he wants to go give this good news. And Joab's like, nah, you don't need to go. And so but he, he finally he, he assists, so he lets him go. And David uh, hears from the watchtower saying that, that someone's running, somebody's coming. And he says, it is Ahimeas. And, 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 and David says, oh, he is a good man, so he must be bringing good news. So that's kind of the idea, that a good person brings good news. Well, folks, here in Revelation 19, we got the glor- most glorious of all news we could ever receive. We are going to be with Christ forever. We're going to be made whole, enemies removed. Everything is going to be provided. This is. Gl- the glorious of all news. This is divine news. So I believe it's John getting carried away here. And the, and the one giving this news, he starts to worship him. And the angel corrects him. Folks, it is the hope and assurance that one day we will truly experience this day that should empower us to live all of our days for Christ. To not lose hope, to not grow weary in doing good, to not give in to the temptations of this world, to not fear what man can do to us. Because we have our glorious marriage supper with the Lamb waiting for us. We should meditate on this every day of our lives. Praise Him. Finally, we close with this. It goes along with our fourth hallelujah. The end of verse 10 says, for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. That sentence has uh, stumped a lot of interpreters, but this, this is what I believe it means. All of Scripture points to Jesus. All of Scripture. All this points to Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All, the, all that God has inspired in here was, was, was about the testimony of Jesus. It is to point to Jesus. It's all about Him. God, our God is revealed in Christ. Everything points to Him. All of Scripture and therefore all of history points to Jesus. That's how we need to see everything. Everything, either pointing people to Jesus or pointing people away from Jesus. And therefore we need to be all about Jesus. Point, putting, putting all of our hope in Jesus, living for Jesus, and pointing people to Jesus. 
Folks, we have a great wedding to look forward to. Our wedding. So let's invite all the guests we can for the greatest celebration the world has ever seen. And with that, let's pray. Father, we, we just give you all the praise because it all belongs to you. Our salvation belongs to you. All power belongs to you. All glory belongs to you. All the future, all, all the present, all of this world, all of creation belongs to you. We praise you for your grace you have poured out on us in Christ. Christ is our only, our only hope, our only claim. Father, forgive us for taking our eyes off Jesus. Forgive us for taking our eyes off these promises you've given us, taking our eyes off the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. We pray, Father, you put our eyes back on it. We pray you help, help us to help one another. You, you would empower us, give us grace to help one another to keep our eyes focused on your promise to us. And that day we will be with you forever. We know your spirit dwells within us, but we long to see you face to face, to have all of our enemies removed, and to experience the full blessing of being in Christ, the full blessing. No more hindrance from any sin, weakness. No, that we would be able to see it all and experience it all. Thank you, Father. We pray if there's anyone here who does not know you as Savior, Father, you would give grace to them today to believe on you. Bless us, Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.